Music. Here at On Deck Sound Studio. Matt Starr is here, drummer with Ace Freely, along with Mr. Big, and I'm pleased to be joined for the first time by Matt Starr, and welcome. Good to be here. Thank you for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Yeah. When did you know this is what you wanted to do? When did it all start to come together in terms of drumming and music? It, it came together when I was eight years old. I grew up in uh, Rocky Hill, Connecticut, small town. I was a kid up the street, Scott Cabala. was older, had some records, had a Kiss album called Kiss Alive 2. came out in 1978. And I opened it up and there was... I saw flames and smoke and sparks and four dudes that looked like they were having a good time. And I thought, I had a feeling when I saw that that I never had before. And I've never had it since. And so, you know, looking back, I can recognize that that was the moment. In that moment, I didn't know. I just had this feeling. It was like, wow, this is like the feeling from Star Wars and the feeling from, you know, listening to a great song and the feeling from this and this. And it was all in one. And, and that was just a moment of clarity. And, uh, and that's just, this just guided me ever since. So that was, again, it wasn't even a musical thing where I said, I want to play music. I just said, I want to be in there with those guys, whatever, whatever that is. I just yeah. want to be in there. So then who was it who fundamentally, profoundly had that effect on you to play drums? Well, it was my, my mom because I went through the JC Penny catalog as we did back in the day or the uh, the analog version of Amazon. And I picked out a guitar. I was in fourth grade and I said, I want this guitar and this amplifier. And my parents were great because they never said, okay, for Christmas presents. They just said, you just give us a list and you'll, you'll get what you get, you know? So we never knew. But that year I badgered them so long that my mom said, okay, okay, we're going to get you the guitar. I said, great. Christmas morning comes, I got a record player. And then they bring out a bike. I'm like, a bike and a guitar? This is amazing. And then as the morning goes on, there's you know, it's, it's a good run, you know, turntable and a, and a bike. And I go, where's the guitar? And she goes, oh, honey, we didn't get you the guitar because, you know, we didn't think you'd, you'd, you'd appreciate it because you knew you were going to get it. I said, no, I'm, I'm now mad. So I moped around the house for about a week. And then she said, you know, you could play in the school band. And I said, I don't want to play drums. And I thought about some more. I said, all right, I'll play drums. So my guitar was my first choice. I love the drums and I'm grateful that that's where I ended up, but uh, it, it wasn't like there was, there was a drummer that inspired me. I just loved rock and roll, wanted the guitar, that didn't pan out, so okay, I'll play drums. How does one change the role then, whether it was with Ace, whether it was with Mr. Big, when you look at the landscape, when you survey the landscape, how does one change the role of the band through the drummer? Well, the drums are, are everything. You know, Ginger Baker famously said, uh, you know, a, a good band with a bad drummer is a bad band. You know, a good band with a great drummer is a great band. And that's so true, you know, because it's the backbone of everything. So I think of drums as like the spine of the body and then the, the vocals are the face. And the guitars are the arms. I mean, your arms can be okay, but as long as your spine and your face are working, then that's good. And there's a lot of bands that I've, you know, I'm a fan of. And I said, you know, yeah, the arms are okay, but the spine and that face is is strong, you know. So yeah, the drums can dramatically impact things. I think one thing that I learned later on is just intent. You know, what is your intention? Because four drummers go play the same exact thing and they can sound completely different, you know? So I think the the intent that you approach the instrument with is huge. And I, my favorite compliment I ever got was from a producer, Warren Huard, who works with Jack Douglas a lot and Aerosmith, et cetera. But he, he's English and he goes, everything you play sounds tough. And I go, that's it. You know, I want it to sound East is that Coast. The, is that the one word you feel best describes your playing? Tough? No, I, I would say like, um, I want it to to feel honest, you know, which is, that's a wide range of things, right? Cause Joni Mitchell's being honest and so is Johnny Ramone. So it's like, well, we're, you know, where's the middle ground, but just sincere. So like no cute stuff, just, and I, a word I use actually, I think is, uh, I used in a session yesterday, a band I was producing working class. I want to sound working class. So it sounded like you're working, not too slick. Now I like the sound of when you, I, sometimes you see somebody do something and it seems effortless, mm. and I appreciate that. 
but I like it when it sounds like it's hard. Like Pete Townsend always sounded like he was fighting with his guitar, and I love that that tension. So then let's go back and breathe life into what you just said, honesty. Mm-hmm. From there, let's go to believability. Some drummers say it's all about feel. Some drummers would say feel and technique, musical prowess. Mm -hmm. Is feel more important to you as opposed to technique? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I, I think you need as much technical prowess as it takes to get across what you're trying to say. So you got Carl Palmer and then you've got Ringo. And it's like, if you get your point across, that's it. And so feel is everything. Are we um, are we able to curse or not curse? Or maybe not. Okay, anyway. If, if you can't get laid to me playing the drums, then it's no good. You know what I mean? It's I do know gotta, because oftentimes I like to make that Yeah, connection. it's got to have that. And because really, what else are we doing here on the planet? We're just making more of each other. You know what I mean? And we're finding each other and we're being attracted and we're developing. So if I can't really foster that, if that's not infused into what I'm doing, then I'm, I'm kind of lost. How do you want to see your playing mature? How do I want to see my playing mature? How do you? Oh, right. Want to see, how do you? As as you you get more seasoned, you get you become more of a veteran. You move on. Mm -hmm. How do you want to see what you feel, what you think, how you play? Even if it's we're taking technique, but we're not using it in terms of the word technique. Right. We're using it in terms of how do you see yourself moving forward? I think just to get deeper on what I'm doing, it took a while to really accept the way I the way I play and be fine with that, you know, which is, I like playing simple. I like playing just the pocket. I like playing the groove and supporting the song. Mm. So just to get deeper into that, you know, and more consistent and more able to just, to not think, I mean, thinking is the worst thing we can do when we're on stage, you know? So to just have that absolute connection from that impulse and then it just comes out of the hands and it just happens. Do you want to deconstruct the drum set in terms of less cymbals, less drums? Do you want to deconstruct the size of the set? <clears throat> no, not really. I, I, I'm not too experimental in that way. But uh, if I can refrain from hitting the cymbals for a while, at least in a, a part of a song, I enjoy that. So again, taking things away. It's like, how much can I take away and still have this song support itself? And again, the better the song, like Tom Petty, you don't even need drums. It's just there. You know, and so you just put the drums in and it just gets better. So um, I'm definitely a fan of just taking things away and then seeing how little I can actually do and have it still work. I asked Jimmy Bell this. I want to ask you the same question. Matt Starr in the studio mm -hmm. and his approach to Matt Starr in concert performing. I sweat more. <laughs> My cymbals are a little higher because it looks better. Um and in the studio, I have a habit of, I will just look at a thing on the wall, but I'm not actually looking at it. And it's sort of a meditative kind of thing, but I'll just kind of get this focus happening and I'm playing and my eyes are just kind of checked out. But when it's live, I've really got to be paying attention to what's going on. But I really like being in the studio because I can just work and it doesn't matter how I look when I'm working, you know? So um, I would say live too, there's a bit more spontaneity you know and if i feel like things need a little a little jolt i'll just do something you know on the drums where if we're in the studio it's more about you know creating that that moment and and you know in live when the the moment happens and then it's gone but in the studio it's forever that one is better or worse there's the precision in the studio but there's the enthusiasm the energy and the excitement on stage right does one speak more to you resonate more to you i th i think it's equal and i know a lot of guys especially drummers who do not like being in the studio because i th think they don't like being underneath the microscope but i really enjoy that and i frankly like the isolation you know and kind of the solitude and we're just going to work on this thing and there's it's like the shopping mall you know it's like there's no clocks there's never a clock in the studio. There's never a clock at the mall. I just don't worry. Just keep spending money. It'll be fine, you know? <laughs> so same thing with the studio. So I really enjoy that, that that very like isolated, like you're in the womb, you know, you're creating. And and you can, that didn't work. Let's do something else that, you know? So I, I do enjoy the studio. I think if I had to pick one, 
Yeah, but they're both so different. And um, what I'm finding through this whole quarantine is process is that I really enjoy being around people. I really miss just connecting with other human beings. When you've come out from behind the drum set with your own band mm -hmm. and you've, I'm going to just sing now. I'm just going to be the front man in that band. Yeah. The creative process behind the drums is different for you in front of the band. Yeah. Speak to that. Yeah, I mean, well, when I'm in front, then I'm the I'm the songwriter, right? So I'm I'm dictating a lot more, and I'm needing it to feel a certain way to be able to get my thing across, you know. So there's a there's a lot more. Um, both roles have equal responsibility, but there's less delegating going on. So when I'm in behind the drums, I'm just playing the drums, everybody, I'm not delegating anything, I'm, but I, you have a huge amount of responsibility. But when I'm out front, I am, uh, you know, delegating. And so I, it needs to be a little more like this. It needs to be a little more. And if someone, you know, I need to be able to explain myself and, and get what I, what I want from all the other players. So yeah, it's a, it's a different, um, it's, it's a lot of pressure. You know, when I went back behind the drums, I realized, you know what, I'm going to be the best damn soldier, maybe, you know, an elite, but but still the, the best soldier and let the artist be the general. I don't have to be the general. Like if if we win the war or not, like I, I'm going to I'm going to make every shot. I'll do whatever you tell me to do. But you you just you tell me what you need me to do. So that hasn't being in in front being on the stage as the singer and the songwriter has enabled me to be a better drummer because I know what I want when I'm leading a band and I just basically want people to say I got it yep let's do it whatever you say yep let's do it let's do it and so then I get behind the drums I'm able to be that for somebody else and your singer and you and you as a singer songwriter does that feed you too it it does yeah it does um, I haven't done that in a number of years, like on and off I will, but not as a, as a steady thing. I really enjoy, again, the, the lack of pressure, you know, to just play the drums. Now, again, when you've got, you know, 20,000 people out in front and you're playing with somebody who you grew up listening to their records, like you, you would think there's a certain amount of pressure there, but, you know, it's cool. And I just, I just do my drummer world, you know? So I do really, um, I like just being, I'm really enjoying being behind the drums. And it kind of scared me that I wasn't really feeling the impulse to write. But you know what? Uh, That's okay. I don't, I don't have to. You know, I have a guitar. I have a voice. I can. Do you have, do you see it as a responsibility and an obligation to yourself as the drummer, to the band and the audience equal? my responsibility to myself and the, I kind of take myself out of the equation and that's been actually very freeing so if I'm working with somebody and they say hey can you play this sure you know if they say what do you think about this well then I can share my opinion but um my obligation is first to the artist the person I'm playing with because they wrote the song that's their experience that's their heartache that's their life that they wrote in you know in, in melody and in lyrics and so i'm there to support that and and even to the extent that you know they want this and i'm like that's kind of messing actually with the vocal but you know what if it makes them feel the way they want to feel okay you got it you know so so again i take myself out of it i expect a certain amount of ex just professionalism and proficiency and all of that as as a worker yeah there's a know? level of quality and a standard of excellence you put on yourself right yeah and that's always been the case since i was a kid gotcha you know i i just turned 50 two weeks ago and my wife put together this video montage of all these people wishing me happy birthday it was so great my dad told this story he goes i would watch you like you were nine years old and you draw pictures of the guys and kiss and then you'd look at it and if it wasn't good enough you ripped it up and threw it in the trash and started over and he goes i've watched you do this over and over and i've seen you do that with your life where you just if it's not up to your standards then you just do it over so then what's the toughest part for you as a drummer, the toughest part, the most difficult for you? What's the, the Herculean process of your artistry? 
is it the practicing all the time? Is it the... No, because I, I practice less and less as the years go on, truth be told. Um, you know, I think it's probably just at, at as I get older, just the physicality of it, you know, because it's, and it's not, and again, if I'm playing drums, that's a good day. So, you know, you're saying like, what's the biggest challenge? Frankly, nothing is a challenge that if I get to do this for work and get paid and pay and, you know, take care of my family by doing what I love, that's a great day. So, but yeah, I would say as I get a little older, it's just the physicality of it. You know what I mean? And um, yeah, little, little aches and pains here and there that we all get <laughs> and, uh, and then just managing them, you know, but it's a funny thing because I find when I'm on the road for longer then they go away because I have a way to manage them. But it's like, if I haven't been playing and then I go out and we do a run of two weeks or something almost towards the end of the run, it's kind of, I'm figuring out how to, how to navigate whatever I'm, you know, whatever challenge I'm facing. Being an instructor, mm -hmm. how was it gratifying, satisfying and rewarding? Well, for many years, I, I was a, you know, a drum instructor. I was teaching kids how to play drums. And then when I started getting these bigger gigs, I started doing drum clinics and people come to clinics, ask questions. And the biggest questions I was getting is how did you get the gig with so-and-so? And I realized they weren't looking for a rock and roll story. They were actually saying, how can I, a guy who's playing in local bars, like you said you were, but now you're on tour with this guy that you grew. I grew up with that guy too, but I, I'm not playing with him. So how can I? So I thought, you know what? I am going to just talk about the business because I'm, if you, you can figure out how to play drums and there's plenty of people that can help you be a better drummer. And I'm happy to talk about drumming, but I think the greatest service I can do is explain how you can go to that next level. And it's, it's, it's emotional and mental. Those were the things that I had to face. So that's, you know, I do a lot of coaching now and that's what I talk about. And so how that's gratifying is to watch people take a lifelong dream or, you know, oftentimes I work with people who are younger, but take a dream and bring it into physical manifestation. So not just, oh, I feel good when I talk to you. Okay, that's great. But I'm talking about there's nothing on this canvas and we are going to put something on it. So to bring that dream in your mind into your life. To physically manifest and there's you know there's all kinds of stuff going on here and there's all kinds of stuff we don't understand but there are universal laws and rules as i know you are a disciple of and it's just like when you obey them and work within them amazing things can happen so rock and roll is my excuse to do that they look at you and see what they want to see with inside themselves to the world later on when you look back albums of your past mm -hmm. or just albums in general what would you have who would you have liked to or which albums would you have wanted to record on every and any led zeppelin <laughs> record every and any beatles album access <laughs> bold is love which i'm sure i would have made a mess out of it it was it's fine the way it is love that album oh my god <laughs> love that album. just still, mitch mitchell's playing on that is unbelievable and when i hear that record that record to me always sounds like it was recorded yesterday and like 20 years from now still and oh. i go how did you do that but anyway up from the skies wait until tomorrow there's so many great songs it's on unbelievable that album. that album is really a stunning album yeah you're right yeah and and one of my favorite things in in LA is a uh, at one of the recording studios a soda machine with the Axis Bold is Love cover on the front of the machine. So it's that that Indian image with all the arms and the orange and everything. Yeah. When Matt Starr looks to the future, what does he hope to see? Just bigger and better version of me, you know, and more uh, and more enjoyment. Two. What cards are on the table that he hasn't turned over yet? That he, he wants to know what's, he sees it, does it, they're face down, but he wants to turn it over and see the face card. What does he hope to see? I think just, again, just a bigger, better, clearer version of, of what I am now. Matt Starr, thank you. Pleasure. And that is our conversation with Matt Starr, with our thanks for being here with us. On behalf of all of my colleagues here at On Deck Sound Studio, may your happiness increase always in always, and please keep me in your thoughts.